An Airbus flight crew scrambles to keep their passenger jet in the air. We're losing an engine. We had lost one reverse. We had half the spoilers on the wings not working. They never gave up. Pilots don't give up. On United Airlines Flight 232... Left, right, left, 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 left! The pilots have lost all their critical flight controls. We're turning, we're turning, we're turning! They have to be able to work with each other to save a plane. Over the Bering Sea, pilots stare death in the face. The whole airplane was shaking. While they try to save their jet. Terrifying emergencies. All systems are down to zero. Shine a light on three astonishing events. Billion to one were the odds that this would happen. You're never trained for that. OK, everyone, here we go. United Airlines Flight 232 has left Denver, Colorado for Chicago. Heading home for a few days? Yeah, be good to get back. Today is Children's Day at United Airlines. A child's ticket costs only a penny. 52 of the 285 passengers are children. Captain Al Haynes and his first officer Bill Records are former fighter pilots. Well, looks like we're gonna make Chicago on time. The airplane was trimmed up. We enjoyed a cup of coffee, and weather was good. And all of a sudden, with a bang, it's just uh, like being thrown into a great big tornado of activity. First Officer Bill Records immediately disengages the autopilot and takes control. Have it. What was that? There was no alarms at all, no bells, no whistles, no lights flashing, just this big explosion. I've got control. Check the gates. The pilots struggle to control the plane. Captain Al Haynes tries to figure out the cause. The airplane was shaking so bad you couldn't read the instruments. We lost the number two engine. We're losing hydraulics. Let's shut number two down. The reason you shut down the engine when it fails is you don't know what the damage is to the engine. If it kept turning, it could tear itself apart. A dangerous situation deteriorates. Bill said, Al, I can't control the airplane. And that's a real attention getter. The plane is not responding to the first officer's commands. It's banking further and further to the right. I've got it, Bill. If the pilots can't find a way to level the plane, it will soon be upside down. We had the control wheel as far as it go to the left and as far back on your lap as it would go. You can't do that in flight. So I, there's something drastically wrong. Second officer Dudley Dvorak may have the answer. Dudley, check the cages. What's going on back there? We have no hydraulic fluid left. All systems are down to zero. All three? That's impossible. The plane's hydraulic system carries the commands from the pilot's control column to the aircraft's control surfaces, such as the elevators, rudders, and ailerons. Without fluids, pilots cannot move these crucial flight controls. If you do not have hydraulics, you have absolutely no control. What's it say in the book? The DC-10 has three separate hydraulic systems. If one fails, the other two act as backups but all three systems are now drained. There's nothing in here for anything like this. A billion to one were the odds that this would happen. You're never trained for that. Captain Haynes has to improvise a solution, or his plane is going down. Everybody realized that this was something that we didn't have a procedure for. So you just kind of grab for whatever's working. Let's use the engines. Yeah, why not? I'm going to pull back number one about 10%. You go up on number three, 10%. Nice and slow. By adjusting the power to the two remaining engines, the pilots may be able to level the aircraft. 
Easy does it. Okay, that's got it. The improvised method of control levels the plane, but only for a moment. The nose is going down. What's going on here? United Airlines Flight 232 starts to accelerate downwards. In normal circumstances, pulling back on the control column would raise the elevators and lift the nose of the plane. We have no elevators. Let's try 10%. The pilots increase power to the two forward engines. This is what you have to do because the power creates a lift and that's what you need. The maneuver works. They pull out of the dive. That's got it. Easy, easy. We just dropped a thousand feet. Okay, we gotta land this thing. Find out where the hell we are and get us to the nearest airport. This is United 232. We are declaring an emergency and requesting a vector to the nearest airport. United 232, you're heading towards Sioux City. Would you like to go there? We'll take Sioux City. Start getting the cabin ready. United 232, radar contact. Turn left, heading 255. The pilots are unable to use flight controls, so they turn the plane by staggering the throttles. But as the DC-10 begins to turn, its nose dips. It accelerates downwards again. Haynes and records complete the turn, but they've dropped another thousand feet, and Sioux City is still 40 miles away. I don't think we're going to make the airport, fellas. There's a DC-10 instructor on board who's offering assistance. Okay, let him come up. Could you come with me? Denny Fitch is a United Airlines pilot and a flight instructor for the DC-10. I transition from a passenger to a crew member. And I remember their forearms and their tendons being tense. I remember their knuckles being white. Now go forward, let it come back and lead it away. When I took it all in, the immediate fast conclusion is, Denny, today is the day you're going to die. Tell me what you want, I'll help you. Take the throttles. He can stand between Bill and myself now, and he can operate the alternating thrust a lot easier than we can. OK. Pull back, pull back. Just start it down. And uh, it didn't take long before uh, that I started to sense the airplane's behavior. Is this Sioux City down to the right? That's Sioux City. Their destination might be in sight, but with no flight controls, the crew can't reduce their speed. We had absolutely no way to control the speed. There just there's nothing we can do about it. Even if they can line up with the runway, they still won't be able to control their landing. Emergency workers prepare for the worst. We were facing uh, death. All of us were, and our passengers. A crippled DC-10 is just a few miles from the airport in Sioux City, Iowa. Forward, forward, forward. The plane's airspeed is the only thing keeping it in the air. 
the pilots have no choice but to keep the engine at close to full power. Won't this be a fun landing? <laughs> <laughs> We're going way too fast. We had no flaps. We had no brakes. And we had no way to steer the airplane once we did uh, arrive at the runway. Brace, brace, brace. Only 100 feet from the ground, the nose dips again, further increasing speed. Left, right, left, 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 left. We're turning, we're turning, we're turning. Didn't get it quite right. And, uh... We hit very hard. Wreckage is strewn across the runway and a nearby cornfield. On the initial viewing of the aircraft uh, hitting the ground and tumbling down the ground and a huge fireball and so on and so forth, we didn't expect to find survivors. Thanks to the pilot's skill, 185 people survived. But 111 passengers and cabin crew are dead. Compounding the tragedy, 11 are children. Still inside the cockpit, 590 feet away from the rest of the wreckage, are the pilots. All have survived. I was unconscious. Fortunately, I was knocked out on impact. I have absolutely no recollection of the crash at all had no idea uh, what kind of shape I was in, uh, whether my legs were attached. I had no, I couldn't move my fingers. I was literally pinned to the, to the ground. I was compressed in the wreckage. Uh, white hot pain in my back and my side. Uh, broken ribs punctured the lung. I never lost consciousness. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board need to know why the number two engine exploded in mid-flight and how that led to the catastrophic loss of all hydraulics. Early on, investigators realize that a vital piece of the engine is missing. The fan disc is, uh, is such an obvious part of the front of the engine that uh, when it's missing, you know it. The fan disc is responsible for bringing air into the core. It takes three months to find it. It was discovered in a field approximately 60 miles from the airport. The massive disc is broken in two. How could it break like that? It was extremely unusual, and we really wanted to try and figure out why this thing had uh, what we call burst. Investigators closely examined the fracture points. It's definitely fatigue. It was pretty easy to visually to look at this to see that there was a fatigue crack there. Well, well, well. A microscopic examination reveals an imperfection in the titanium used to make the fan blade. This flaw caused a crack that grew larger over 17 years. A bad batch of titanium? I'd say so. It was only a matter of time before the disc broke. I had it. What was that? When it did, the fragments destroyed all three hydraulic systems. This part was supposed to be inspected uh, on a regular basis, and indeed it was. But uh, where the crack was located simply was extremely difficult to detect. The NTSB immediately recommends more thorough inspections of all engine fan disks. Given the broad system failure, it's astonishing that anyone survived the crash landing. In terrifying conditions, the pilots managed a phenomenal act of flying. Let's use the engines. All four pilots received the Polaris Award. It's the highest civilian aviation decoration, honoring exceptional airmanship and heroic actions. 
we, we got the airplane to the runway. That's the most we could hope for, even more than most people thought we could hope for. And to say that we were heroes in doing that, no. We were just fortunate that the things we tried worked. Here, they were all one team, and they found a way to do something that was technically impossible. It was absolutely astounding that they managed to find solutions. They never gave up. Pilots don't give up. We don't do that. 21 years later, an Australian flight crew will be tested as never before. Qantas Flight 32 has just finished refueling at Singapore Airport. The Airbus A380 is more than halfway through a marathon 22-hour flight from London to Sydney, Australia. There are 440 passengers and 29 crew on board. A former fighter pilot, Richard de Crepney, is one of the few pilots qualified to captain an Airbus A380. Everyone ready for takeoff? The A380 is the latest generation of innovation, automation and excellence. And it's the largest, most complex aircraft in the sky. First Officer Matt Hicks' main duty is to monitor the vast number of electronic gauges and computer displays needed to fly this state-of-the-art aircraft. Everything's looking good here, Richard. The more automated aircraft get, it doesn't necessarily make them easier to fly. Uh, it just makes them different to fly. Today, de Crepney's flight skills are being evaluated by fellow pilot Dave Evans. This is an annual requirement at Qantas. The A380 is powered by four massive Rolls-Royce engines. Each can deliver 72,000 pounds of thrust. They design wonderful engines, very reliable. V1, rotor. Autopilot. On. Climb out checklist, please. Uh, auto thrust is set and ECAM is clear. The ECAM, or Electronic Centralized Aircraft Monitor, keeps watch over all the onboard systems and alerts the crew to the slightest malfunction. The first few minutes in the air are uneventful. The atmosphere in the cabin was, was perfectly casual. We were chatting away the whole time since we, we, since we were seated. We're losing an engine. There was the loud explosion. My reaction immediately, I think, was, oh my goodness, maybe this is it. We've lost number two. There's something wrong with the A380's number two engine. Holding 7,500 feet. De Crepney takes back control from the autopilot. I press the altitude hold button, which would cause the nose to lower and the aircraft level. Matt, ECAM actions, on it. Hicks faces a barrage of error messages on the ECAM. We had to work our way through it and build up a picture of what was going on with the aeroplane. Number two's overheating. The crisis escalates. The engine is now in flames. This plane is in very real danger of becoming a fireball. Qantas Flight 32 is in serious trouble. Number two's overheating. First Officer Matt Hicks activates the emergency extinguishers inside the burning engine. Fire number two. Push button. Confirm. It was stressful. It was difficult. The warning's off. I think the fire's out. They've dealt with one alarm. But the emergency isn't over. Failure messages persist. OK, I've cleared slate one and two. What have you got for me now? Hydraulics. In a training environment, you probably only do two or three consecutive failures. And in this case, I think we had 58. 
And that list of failures is growing. Degraded pneumatics, hydraulics, electrics, power to the left wing shut down, flaps, slats, and ailerons are damaged but operable. Captain de Crepney needs to get the A380 back to Singapore before it's impossible to fly it. We don't want to stay one minute more in the air than we have to. Singapore, on us 3-2, we require a left turn back towards Singapore. On us 32, Singapore, turn left heading 020. Singapore is about 217 miles away. The captain needs more information on the damaged engine, but it can't be seen from the cockpit. Second officer Matt Johnson goes back to investigate. The hole that was in the wing that had been made by the explosion seemed, from what I could see, quite a large hole, like about a couple of feet across, and all the metal was jagged and sticking up, and it, we could see the stream of the fuel coming out. The A380's wings are filled with more than 100 tons of highly flammable fuel. We were all just wondering what was going to happen next. What can you tell me, Mac? Number two's blown apart, cut holes through the wing, and we're leaking fuel. The news helps explain why so many systems are failing. Vital flight controls run through the wing. These are likely damaged by shrapnel from the burst engine. We had so many checklists, 100 in the air, that it took Matt 55 minutes to stabilize the aircraft so that this aircraft situation didn't get worse. That is unprecedented in aviation history. The pilots are finally near Singapore. Dave. I need you to run the numbers on this landing. Czech captain Dave Evans does the math. Three engines, full load, all that. He uses the A380 landing software to calculate how much runway they'll need to bring the huge plane to a stop. The computer says we can't make it. Runway's too short. With the nine failures that I'd uh, put into the system and the surface conditions in Singapore, uh, at our maximum landing weight, I couldn't come up with an answer. The A380 is weighed down with fuel. Almost none of the 105 tonnes it took on for the flight to Sydney is used up. Can we dump some fuel? No, it's a good idea, but we can't. Fuel transfer pumps are down. Damn it. The heavy load of flammable fuel means any landing attempt will be dangerous. We were some 40 tonnes above our maximum landing weight. And the heavier you are, the more runway and the higher speeds will be on your approach. Evan's first set of numbers gives him the worst case scenario. He tries again with some more optimistic numbers. OK. Looks like we can do it with 139 metres to spare. 139 metres surplus on a 4,000 metre runway is, is a slim margin, but it's better than a minus 139 metres. What do we need for our approach speed? 166 works. Captain de Crepney doesn't know if his plane is capable of landing with any precision. OK, let's see what you can do. He rolls the plane carefully left and right to simulate lining up with a runway. We had degraded roll control, so I knew that we had to certify the aeroplane ourselves to fly before we landed. OK. There's barely enough control to roll the plane to the right. If the few flight controls that we have remaining are working to their limit, then clearly we have very little margin for manoeuvring when we come into land. Full green. Confirm gear down. Qantas Flight 32 is now just two minutes from landing. De Crepney adjusts the throttle so he can land at the slowest speed possible to make it easier to stop. Here's me, low. Damn, not that slow. Here's me, low. The Airbus is getting close to stalling. Here's me, low. We sped up three knots, we would run off the runway. We slow down one knot, we get a speed warning. De Crepney has just one shot at landing Flight 32. Everybody ready? At the end of the day, it just came down to, I think we've covered everything. Can anyone think of anything? No. OK, let's go and do it.
Confirm fire services standing by. Affirmative. 100. The pilots of Qantas Flight 32 struggle to guide their plane towards the runway. You think about your kids, you think about your wife, and uh, that's just what you do, and then it was game on again. 50, 40, 30, 20. We had lost one reverse. We had half the spoilers on the wings not working. We had the ailerons not making a speed brake action. If the pilots can't slow the plane down, they'll overshoot the runway. Brakes, brakes, Rich. Put on the brakes. Pump them, push them. Brakes, full brakes, Rich. I am. My feet are flat to the floor. The A380 stops with just 500 feet to spare. Beautiful. Oh. Welcome to Singapore, guys. Despite an engine exploding, a massive system failure, and being weighed down with fuel, the pilots of Qantas Flight 32 have landed their crippled jet with no loss of life. When we finally, finally walked off the plane, there was a great sense of relief, and I noticed my legs were shaking, uh, which I kind of thought, oh, why are my legs shaking? I guess, maybe. I must have been a bit more nervous than I was aware. Safely on the ground, the flight crew can finally check out the engine. I was shocked. I had never seen such extraordinary damage to an airplane before. The Trent 900 is an increasingly popular engine. What a disaster. I've never seen anything like it. It's up to the Australian Transport Safety Bureau to find out what happened. An uncontained engine failure is a pretty rare event. We knew that this was going to be a big investigation, particularly for the ATSB. Investigators examined the engine that burst into flames. Oil fire. The inside is charred and covered with soot and oil. This strongly suggests there was an oil leak. Kev, I think we got it. At that point, it was, it was oh, wow. This is, this is a really important moment of the, of the investigation. Investigators determined that a narrow pipe snapped and released oil into the area around the turbine disc. The broken part is called a stub pipe. This nearly brought down an A380. Jeez, man. Investigators believe the oil from the broken stub pipe ignited and burned at more than 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Fire number two. Push button. Confirm. The fire damaged the drive shaft, which allowed the turbine disc to spin faster and faster until it broke apart. The internal oil fire happened so quickly and accelerated that the crew had absolutely no opportunity to shut down that engine before the engine failure. But what caused the stub pipe to break, nearly killing 469 people? Investigators send what's left of the pipe to the engine's manufacturer, Rolls-Royce. Engineers make a startling discovery. One side of the pipe is thinner than the other. That allowed it to break apart, spray the engine with oil, and cause a near catastrophic fire. It's no wonder it cracked. We're only talking, it was 0.35 millimeters in thickness. It's a couple of sheets of paper. There are 20 A380s in service with the same Rolls-Royce engine. The ATSB calls for a fix. As a result of this investigation, all engines that had non-conforming oil feed pipes have been removed from service. Investigators conclude that Flight 32 ended safely because the highly trained crew responded quickly and effectively. Matt, he came actions. I'm truly proud of everyone in the aircraft that day. And I'm really proud of the decisions we made, the way we worked as a unified, cohesive team. 
Dave, I need you to run the numbers on this landing. I think in every regard, the Qantas 32 story is one of aviation's finest hours. What a pilot needs to deal with the unexpected is this combination of skill, training, intelligence. You know, they aren't just flying an autopilot. They're someone who understands all the systems on their plane and by troubleshooting, figure out what they might do with one system to make up for the loss of another. And that's a very special skill. Eight years before, that same kind of skill was pushed to the limit. Northwest Airlines Flight 85 is making its way over the Bering Sea towards Narita Airport in Japan. Frank, I'm taking the lasagna. You get option B. So option B includes starving? Captain Frank Gieb is at the controls of the Boeing 747-400. He has more than 11,000 flying hours. You sure you're not hungry? Mike Fagan, a Vietnam veteran with 25 years flying experience, is the first officer. Trust me, I'm good. Flight 85 is more than six hours from landing at Narita. Captain Gieb faces a life and death scenario. Do we lose an engine? Do we still have engines? Still have all engines, that's not it. The lives of 386 passengers depend on what the pilots do in the next few minutes. Northwest Airlines Flight 85 is on the brink of disaster. The plane banks violently to the left. Captain Gieb disconnects the autopilot and pulls back on the control column to level the wings. Frank, you got it? Yeah, I think I've got it. If it's not the engines, then we have a problem with the rudder. The pilots have leveled the plane, but they're still struggling to maintain control. The warning system confirms Gieb's suspicion. Yaw damper, lower. The rudder system isn't responding. The rudder controls the plane's left and right movements. On the 747, there's both an upper and lower rudder. For some reason, the lower rudder is stuck 17 degrees to the left. Using the foot pedals, Gieb can barely control the upper rudder, which is still functioning. Anchorage is two hours behind us. Call them and declare an emergency. We're turning around. He needs the rudder to turn the plane around. But Captain Gieb can't rush his moves. We had no idea what the problem was. So uh, Frank was very cautious on using the rudder, which means that he had to use full aileron to control the aircraft. P3, get them back. Gieb calls on the senior pilots, Captain John Hansen and First Officer David Smith, resting in the flight crew's cabin. Let's move it. What's happening? Lower rudder is hard over 17 degrees to the left. We don't know why, and it's not responding. We don't know what else is wrong yet. Frank was the junior captain. I was the senior captain. And when I saw him battling the controls, I decided that I was going to take over. First Officer Fagan must now hold the yoke steady as Captain Gieb relinquishes control of the plane. I have control. Any mishandling of the controls could send the plane into a fatal spin. I was pretty appalled at how much force it took to fly this big, beautiful airplane. Keeping the huge aircraft level at 35,000 feet is becoming increasingly difficult. The control wheel was shaking because the whole airplane was shaking. Hansen decides to descend to a lower altitude where denser air will provide more lift. But we had to be very careful how we flew this airplane. The tail might be coming apart. The rudder might be just barely hanging on, or it could be a hydraulic problem. You ready to do this? All set. You want to do it very carefully. So they're handling the controls under this really unusual circumstance as carefully and gently and as delicately as they can. 28,000. 
the pilots get the plane down to 28,000 feet. But the physical effort needed to fly the damaged 747 is taking its toll. Yeah, my leg's starting to cramp up. I'm having a tough time holding this together. We were pushing so hard with our leg on that rudder pedal that we could only do it for about 10 minutes. You're gonna have to take it. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Nice and easy. They were facing really a very confusing situation. It was something that they had never done in training, something they had never seen in training. There are going to be some circumstances where a pilot is, is going to have to figure out what to do on his or her own. The pilots have managed to reach Anchorage, Alaska and slowly descend to 14,000 feet. Flying gets even more difficult. The rudder is tied to airspeed and altitude. The lower you get, the further the rudder goes out. So then it required more rudder, more aileron, and that was uh, physically exhausting. OK, we can't do this anymore. Let's use the engines. Dave, get on the levers. One and two up, three and four down. Just like on United Flight 232, First Officer David Smith will stagger the throttles to help control the plane. Minutes before touchdown, the pilots increase power to the left engines while reducing power to the right. This uneven thrust should help keep the plane straight. I thought, if there's ever going to be a time that you fly a perfect approach, it's got to be this one. If the crew makes a mistake, there will be no second chance. With their rudder damaged, Captain John Hansen and his crew now need to land the aircraft. Northwest 85, clear to land. Emergency equipment standing by. Roger, cleared to land. Let's make sure we get it right the first time. As far as the missed approach is concerned, we're not going to do one. We're just going to do it right the first time. We're going to put it right on the spot. On touchdown, First Officer Fagan will take the control column. Captain Hansen will guide the front wheels with the tiller. OK, everyone, here we go. One full step, and the plane could come off the runway. Touchdown in five. Prepare for impact. Great! Got it? I got it. We got it. Good job, Mike. Good job, guys. Everyone in the cockpit was finally able to exhale. Against the odds, the crew performs an astounding feat of flying. All 404 people on board survive. With the emergency over, controllers can see what the pilots can't. That's uh, quite the rudder you got there. Must have been a hell of a ride. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a real joyride. Yeah. <laughs> the pilots have narrowly avoided a fatal crash. Now the NTSB must find out what went wrong on Flight 85. Investigators immediately discover a trail of hydraulic fluid leaking from the rear of the plane. The pilot's foot pedals are linked to the rudder by a hydraulic power control module, or PCM. When the pilot depresses the pedals, the PCM adjusts the hydraulic pressure, which moves the rudder. They opened up the access panels in the tail and they noticed that the end cap on the control module had separated. The end cap is a circular piece about two and a half inches in diameter, and it had completely fractured all of the way around its diameter and had then fallen off. Without the end cap in place, the internal piston moved too far, resulting in a rudder hardover. The failure of this one piece of engineering 
nearly brought down the plane. Exhaustive tests can't determine the cause of the fracture. We were very frustrated when we realized that all of the paths we chased down didn't give you that aha, eureka moment. Nevertheless, the NTSB recommends that airlines check the power control module more frequently. On Flight 85, the sudden loss of the lower rudder would have caused a catastrophe, if not for the quick reactions of the pilots. Frank, you got it? Yes, I think I've got it. If Frank hadn't reacted the way he had, we probably would not be here to tell the story. Captain Gieb's actions in the first few seconds were critical to saving the plane. It then took all four pilots to get the plane to anchorage and land it safely. I think this crew did a phenomenal job in getting this aircraft back on the ground. In 2003, the Airline Pilots Association honored the crew of Northwest Airlines Flight 85 for their incredible flying. We got it. <laughs> in this day and age of automated cockpits, hand flying is in danger of becoming a lost art. We have to remember as pilots that we are there because of our flying skills. We had prepared so well for this thing that the failure was not an option. Your pilot is only as good as his or her training. So if you want your pilots to be superheroes and save the plane, you have to give them the best training. They have to have a lot of experience, lots of hours in the air, and they have to be able to work with each other to save a plane when the unthinkable happens.